send back stateside. Native American Marines played a crucial role at Iwo Jima. In the first two days of the battle, using a code developed in their own language, Navajo Marines sent and received 800 messages relaying critical information about troop movements and military strategy. Every Marine commander from the summer of 42 until the end of the war commended the Navajo code talkers and ascribed the success of battlefield victory to their service, to their work. The Navajo are perhaps the best known code talkers, but they were not the only tribe to provide this service. There were more than a dozen others, and they weren't the first. During World War I, Choctaw code talkers using telephones sent encrypted messages in their language. Their success inspired the Indian code talking of World War II. Despite their contributions, Indian soldiers still battled stereotypes. Nearly every Native man remembers being called chief, sometimes as a term of endearment, sometimes not. Native women seem to face less discrimination. During World War II, Joreen Coker was one of 800 Native women on active duty. Coker served in the Volunteer Emergency Services, better known as the WAVES. From her base in Pearl Harbor, Coker processed paperwork for soldiers who had completed their tours of duty. They were polite and uh, they were uh, just took me as, as a human being and no discrimination whatsoever. And uh, I think that that was one thing that I learned that there were people that you know, did not discriminate. And I think that uh, probably I, I've seen more discrimination since I've been out of service than, than while I was in service. There were women warriors on the home front as well. Women like Alice Lowe, the daughter of World War I veteran Edward Denomi. Lowe worked on blueprints for the Norden bomb site at the Perfex Corporation in Milwaukee. It was imperative that I make everything match these specifications. Uh, little alterations in the blueprints from one to another. I made sure that it came out exactly right because uh, I hadn't met my husband yet, but um, my older brother was in the Air Force, my brother-in-law was in the Air Force, and there were people that I knew that were going in to serve, and so I felt I was doing my part. Lowe's job at the Perfects company paid $45 a week, three times what she had been making as a telephone operator. When the war comes to an end, there's a sudden drop in this, this momentary wealth that urban Indians particularly had enjoyed. Their income drops from $3,200 to $1,200 a year in the immediate post-war period. So a lot of the Indian women are losing their jobs, but also Indian men in these factories are likewise losing their jobs in preference to white veterans who are coming home. Families who had relocated to cities now found themselves disconnected, stranded economically and culturally. So much change occurred after World War II. Changes in countries, country boundaries, leadership, uh, changes in industry, changes in technology. But the greatest change of all, which didn't occur, was a change in attitudes. Indians were still outside of the American mainstream.
everybody knew that we were going to be engaged because we knew that the Chinese were in the area. November 1950. As night fell on Ken Bradshaw and other nervous members of Company E of the Army's 19th Infantry Regiment, they knew the enemy was close. The enemy realized that American firepower was enormous and that the, as a, one of the responses that they had was to what, the, what was called holding on to Americans by the belt buckle, get close, because then we couldn't use our heavy weapons. American forces had pushed to within 60 miles of the Chinese border, only to be driven back. They seemed unstoppable. Here was this Asian army that was now challenging the United States. It, it, it was very, it was frightening. Our people were confronted by uh, the numbers. Always outnumbered. Bradshaw's buddy, Corporal Mitchell Red Cloud, a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, was on the perimeter walking the ridge on hill number 123. You get nervous knowing that the that the, the big class was coming, you know? Well, just sitting there waiting, one, one sleeping, the other one staying awake, and then all of a sudden, I heard this voice all around either, here they come or wake up or something like that, but I believe it was here they come. And at that point, all hell broke loose. They hit us from the rear, and you could see them pouring up that hill. And then when they got to the top, by that time, uh, I'm looking around me, and uh, the guys were killed. I met you, maybe 25 to 30 yards away, at his outpost. Single-handedly, Red Cloud was keeping the Chinese at bay, giving his unit time to organize a retreat. So I got rid of all my hand grenades that I had. And I started falling back. Red Cloud refused to leave his post, even after being wounded. According to official accounts, he pulled himself to his feet, wrapped his arm around a tree, and continued to fire. He sacrificed himself so that others could escape. So, of course he's the one who saved it. He saved anybody that was alive after that battle. On April 25th, 1951, Congress awarded Red Cloud the Medal of Honor for dauntless courage and gallant self-sacrifice. A member of the Thunderbird clan of the Ho-Chunk Nation, Red Cloud grew up among warriors. He was a decorated World War II Marine who re-enlisted in the Army when the Korean conflict erupted. From what my uncle had said, he did want to go through all branches of the service, that he would have hit all four. I talk about proud, you know. That's, that's really taking pride to the limit, and I wish he could have done it. To remember Red Cloud and other fallen Native and non-Native veterans, each Memorial Day, the Ho-Chunk Nation holds a flag-raising ceremony in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. It's a kind of a patriotic uh, symbol. Ho-Chunk elder Donald Blackhawk says the ceremony dates back to the end of World War II, when the community wanted to recognize the contributions of its fallen warriors. You know, they start raising these flags like that, and not that many at the beginning because the uh, Second World War veterans are still pretty much around. Of course, the Korean ones were pretty young yet, you know, they're, they're pass away and, and they're given a flag because they've done their duty and uh, they've done their, their, what they're supposed to do when they're in the service. On this Memorial Day, 
The Red Cloud family has asked Ken Bradshaw to raise Mitchell's flag. How I remember him is he was a fantastic warrior. He was good at everything. He's a legend. He's one of my legends. Over the years, the legend has grown with additional honors the U.S. military has bestowed upon Red Cloud. In 1957, the Army renamed the headquarters of the 2nd Infantry Division in Weejambu, Korea, Camp Red Cloud. In 1999, the U.S. Navy launched a ship bearing his name. Best event of my whole life is to feel the, the spirit and and everything that went around the ship christening and the leading up to it and just being involved of it. But as soon as the ship hit the, the water, of course that was just so emotional. And then my daughter, she says, look mom, the choke is here. And the red clouds just started to form right behind the ship. It was incredible. And uh, just all the people that came to honor him and be part of that ceremony, I, I can't even, tell you how emotional it was. It was just, I mean still today, it's just there. It's incredible. The legend of Mitchell Red Cloud lingers in memorials like this one. But there's another story the Ho-Chunk remember. The story of Sergeant John L. Rice, a kinsman from the Ho-Chunk of Nebraska known as the Winnebago. Like Red Cloud, Rice was a decorated World War II veteran who re-enlisted during the Korean conflict, and like Red Cloud, was killed in action. It took nearly a year for the Army to return Rice's body. His widow, Evelyn, who was Caucasian, arranged for his burial at Memorial Park Cemetery in Sioux City, Iowa. In August of, I believe it was 1951, they have the the burial ceremony for Sergeant Rice. Um, there, the, the American Legion post from Winnebago was there. It's predominant. It was all. It was a Winnebago Indian delegation there that that did the ceremony, and uh, it, it concludes. The family leaves. John Rice's casket is uh, 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 is above the open grave. And it's at that point that the cemetery official uh, remarks to the funeral director, boy, there sure were a lot of Indians here at this, at this ceremony. And the funeral director says, well, the deceased, Sergeant Rice, he was a Winnebago. Well, the cemetery director then is astonished. Well, wait a minute, stop the burial. We cannot proceed. This is a, a Caucasian only cemetery. The local reporters, you know, heard about this and began to publicize it and word quickly reached through the channel back to Washington and President Truman um, found out about this and arranged for the Rice family and Sergeant John Rice, his body, to be sent to Arlington Cemetery where perhaps maybe he should have been buried, you know, originally. Rice was buried with full military honors. Both senators from, from Iowa were present. I believe both senators from Nebraska were there. The Commissioner of Indian Affairs attended. I mean, there were very many high-ranking government officials that attended. Sergeant John Rice, memorialized at Arlington, was not the Indian warrior most Americans were used to seeing. Surround and fight, wagon train. So an Indian soldier watching a movie post-World War II, and he's watching the U.S. military that he fights for, fighting his people in the movie. There's a lot of psychological, um, you know, thoughts going on there. In Cold War America, being Indian brought cold comfort. In the 1950s, some mixed-blood Native people began disappearing into the American mainstream, 
passing as Italians and other Southern Europeans. A lot of Native people, in particular people who are not full bloods, but people who are mixed bloods who are passable, then could almost invisibly slip into the American mainstream society and become a part of the American mainstream without people realizing that they were part Indian. The people who looked Indian, the three-quarter bloods, the full bloods, uh, those individuals, obviously, um, uh, you know, the stereotypes were cast towards them even more because of the McCarthyism, because they were not American enough. That was all too apparent to veteran Ed Denomi, whose father served in World War I. During a fishing trip to northern Wisconsin, the two were denied service. So I, I went up and ordered. Dad stood back a little bit. I says, give us three shorty paps. The bartender leaned over and he says, I'm sorry. And I said, uh, I thought he didn't hear me. Give us three shorty paps. He said, I'm sorry, I can't. Whoa! Red light went on. I said, you can't? Are you saying what I think you're saying? He said, like that. And everybody looking at us, Dad says, come on, let's go. I said, hey, this ain't right. You know, I served eight months overseas. You served World War I. I said, we can't get a beer. For many Native veterans, it was time for change. And the Vietnam War delivered it. Each winter on the Fond du Lac and Anishinaabe Reservation in northern Minnesota, Jim Northrup and his family collect sap to make maple syrup. Doing these seasonal activities is very good for my soul because I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing at the right time of the year. Regardless of uh, whether I went to war or not, every year the maple sap continued to flow at the right time of the year. And so, regardless of what is happening with me, I knew that there was something I could depend on, something solid. In this quiet setting, even after 40 years, true peace eludes this Vietnam combat veteran. And I was assigned to India Company, 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines. Northrop's Vietnam War story begins in familiar territory, in a government boarding school. Going to the first boarding school when I was six years old was quite a shock to my young system. But as strange as it was, I adapted to the environment and I survived it. And so that just gave me the inner strength to face what came next. By the time I got to the Marine Corps in 1961, I was still doing the same kind of adjusting and adapting, but now I was getting paid for it, getting my $83 a month. This is something that was taught at a very early age, that I was to be a warrior. That's my role in this society, to be a warrior, because I heard all the stories about the uh, Chippewa fighting the Sioux or fighting the other tribes before the white man came, and then fighting the white man, of course, and then serving, as my grandfather did in World War I, have, uh, four uncles that served in different theaters in World War II. And so it just continued to feed this warrior mentality, this warrior ethos. And so I was just a part of it. And when I graduated from high school, it was just my turn to go. Northrop saw some of the heaviest fighting in the Vietnam War in places like Da Nang, Marble Mountain, and Wa. I come around the corner of a building and there was a, a bad guy facing that way. And he heard me. And as he heard me, he swiveled on his knees and he had a, an American-made Thompson 45 caliber submachine gun. And he was spraying as he was turning. And I thought that was so fluid, of the way he turned like that. And I had time to admire that. Part of me was thinking, 
Oh my god, there's a man shooting at me. I better do something about that. That's the way it seemed like I was thinking while it was happening. And so I fired three round bursts and I saw where I was hitting. And then I adjusted it and fired and dialed him up. In his research, historian Tom Holm found that Native American soldiers were three times more likely to see moderate to heavy combat than non-Indians. He attributes this to the Indian Scout Syndrome, a stereotype rooted in the use of Native American trackers by the U.S. military. More than a hundred years and four major wars later, Indians were still scouting for the U.S. military. Like his father and two brothers, Creek Indian John Yahola served in the 82nd Airborne Division. During the Vietnam War, Yahola was in Cambodia before the Cambodian invasion. And our job basically was to uh, go in there and scout out or recon where the possible enemy positions were, see if there was any weapons, supplies, and uh, we'd recover them. The, the idea that, that uh, somehow it, it's better, actually, to send the Indian out to walk point or <laughs> to, to scout something because they're natural scouts or something like this. The point man is the soldier who walks a few steps ahead of the rest of the unit, looking for landmines, watching for danger. Yahola is a member of the Creek Red Sticks, a combat veterans organization with roots in an ancient warrior society. I volunteered to walk point because I felt that I was most qualified for the job. And I wanted to prove to my ancestors and my elders, like my uncles and my father, that I had the same saying that they did. You want to become a warrior, you want to become accepted by your people, uh, by the American mainstream, um, perhaps be promoted and perhaps even earn your own self-respect. But at the same time, you know, you're accepting the situation of risking your life. And risking psychological damage. Because they were more likely to see the horror of war, Native American soldiers have a high incidence of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, what the military used to call shell shock or battle fatigue. For a long time, uh, they used to have to wake me up with a broom because I'd come out of that bed, you know, ready to kill. But that's kind of died down over the years now. I'm not so spooky as I used to be. Thou shalt not kill. That stuff didn't work here. God must have stayed back in the real world. Is any of this real? Is this a green nightmare I'm going to wake up from? He's Northrop confronted so his PTSD by writing poetry. His eyes saw, his ears heard, his heart felt a numb nothing. His mind analyzed it all as he studied the trail. He amused himself as he walked along. The old story about bullets, ha! Don't sweat the one that's got your name on it. Worry about the one addressed to whom it may concern. This poem, entitled Walking Point, speaks directly to the fears that contributed to his PTSD. Movement, something moving up there. Drop to the mud, rifle pointing at the unknown. Looks like two of them, hunting him. They have rifles, but he saw them first. The Marine Corps takes over. Breathe. Relax, aim, slack, squeeze. The shooting is over in five seconds. The shakes are over in a half hour. The memories are over, never. The human mind and body, everything that you have in your human resource and maybe even beyond that is to kill. To come back from war, you don't want to be a killer anymore. 
I, I think that anybody who is involved in any kind of combat is going to be wounded in some form or fashion. It's going to be an emotional wound that's very, very difficult to heal. But Holm believes Native American soldiers came home with an extra layer of guilt. Participating in the U.S. military's scorched earth tactics in Vietnam was part of their trauma. Well, as we were going through some of the villages, I could see that uh, someone had spent a lot of time making the baskets that they used to process rice, much like we do here at home, uh, how we winnow the rice. And I could see that somebody had spent a lot of time, and we'd just go through and trash it or burn it or something. Our feeling was, if it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't move, burn it. It is what we did. We were the bayonet end of America's foreign policy, and we killed and got killed. Coming back to peace, you don't want to be that same being that has been trained to kill. Many Native communities purify their returning warriors. The Hopi ritually wash the hair of their returning veterans and give them new names. At the urging of a friend, Creek veteran John Yahola visited the sweat lodge of another tribe. When you're sitting in there in the lodge, you're going through the four rounds. You're praying for everybody. I must have really needed it because at the end of that night, I felt like a weight had been lifted off me. I saw things differently. And it made me go back to my own people and learn our ways and go through a cleansing and healing process. Cleansing rituals, according to home, are a way for the community to share the burden of its returning warriors. You bring these kinds of things back into the community and the community gets to know about them and they, they, they start absorbing these experiences. and. Uh, and ideas and emotions and things like this. Telling one's war story to clan mothers or an elder is part of the ritual in many native communities. Northrop says an elder helped him deal with what he called survivor guilt. I couldn't understand it. Uh, the bullets were hitting in front of me, the bullets were passing through the brush on both sides of me making that tick, 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 tick noise as they go through, and other Marines were getting hit. And I could never understand why they didn't hit me. And he helped, he helped me understand it a little better. And he said, it's simple. They did hit you, but they passed right through because you have something to do yet. And that kind of made sense for me. That kind of gave me the, I don't know, I hate to use the word closure, but it gave me some kind of peace I was seeking. Peace for some Native American veterans was short-lived. Like Vietnam veterans of other cultures, Native soldiers returned to a nation divided over the war. They too were divided, and many were disillusioned. You had grown up with, say, poverty. Uh, and uh, then you go out and put your life on the line, and you come back, and nothing changes. It somehow is not that's, that's incorrect. That's not acceptable. In the late 60s and early 70s, red power emerged. Angry protests drew attention to the poverty and despair in Indian country. At the center of the movement, Native American veterans. I think Native communities uh, also, in many ways, look to those folks to give them an idea of what's happening in the outside world. They've, they've been there. When you look at uh, Indian policy, uh, it's one that uh, changes according to uh, different types of catalysts throughout history that causes that change. Poor indeed is one of them. And the change that was happening on a grand scale was happening to individual warriors like Jim Northrup. I carry an Eagle Staff and I have feathers on there and I know it's part of my obligation to talk to the young men going to war now 
and I sent three eagle feathers to Iraq. I told each one of those guys I want them back when they get done with it, bring it back and put it on my staff. Northrop's role as confidant and mentor to the young warriors of his tribal community is part of his obligation to himself as a warrior, as a writer. I began to realize that after I wrote about the war, uh, I didn't have as many nightmares as I used to. You know, it used to be almost every other night. But once I started writing about them, putting them down on paper and then closing the paper up, closing the book up, uh, and I didn't dream about him as much. I didn't have as many symptoms of PTSD. So I think writing about it has saved my life and it's also given uh, people who haven't experienced it a view inside of that crazy, chaotic world called war. This is the Native American Vietnam Veterans Memorial near Nielsville, Wisconsin. The high ground, as it's called, testifies to the complex relationship Native people have with the United States and to their contributions, often ignored and misunderstood, to the U.S. military. But mostly it testifies to their own tribal traditions and the deep meaning of being a warrior. An Indian Marine. I'm not Crazy Horse. I'm not Sitting Bull. What live we had? I think we give it all we had. I'm not Ira Hayes. I'm me. Being called chief is not an honor like you think. I said, you can't. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Hey, do you know this guy? We used to call him chief. He was Choctaw, Cherokee, Cheyenne, or something. I talk about proud, you know. That's, that's really taking pride to the limit, and I wish he could have done it. I'm not a code talker. Your schools robbed me of the language I used to have. It was almost like being a POW in boarding school life. I'm no braver nor more of a coward than you. And I remember being just a small child. I looked up at him and I thought he was 10 feet tall. But when I took that green uniform off, I could be Indian again. Meet a group of senior citizens who have made history by greeting over 900,000 American troops in The Way We Get By on POV tomorrow at 8 on KCET. information on Way of the Warrior, visit pbs.org. Funding provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Great Ideas Brought to Life, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Way of the Warrior is available on DVD by calling 877-868-2250 or write to the address on your screen. We are PBS.